Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be looking at chapter 16 of the Mythical Man Month, which is called No Silver Bullet, Essence and Accident in Software Engineering. The subtitle of the chapter has become one of the most famous quotes to come from this book, and it says the following. There is not a single development in either technology or management technique which by itself promises even one order of magnitude improvement within a decade in productivity, in reliability, in simplicity. I think this speaks to the pervasive fallacy that if we could just do XYZ process better, or we had smarter developers, or we had better tools, then we would be the top dogs and we wouldn't be suffering from the project management issues that seem to plague the rest of the industry. So that's the topic of this chapter, and it's particularly notable because it has since become the most famous chapter of the book. It's also the one that got a follow-up chapter in the subsequent edition of Mythical Man Month that we're going through. So since the author has his own follow-up to comment on the things that have and haven't changed in the ensuing decades between the original edition and the subsequent edition, We'll spend less time covering the entirety of this chapter in favor of the content that comes in the next. This will still be a long video, I suspect, though, because it is a very long chapter. So let's jump into it. We're introduced to this concept of a silver bullet, and what the author means by that is something, a tool or phenomenon or process that makes our engineering teams a lot more productive in the manner that we talked about a minute ago. Much more productive, much more reliable, much more simple. The problem with these silver bullets and why they are fictitious is because the nature of software itself is an unsolvable challenge. There's a quote here which says, the essence of a software entity is a construct of interlocking concepts, data sets, relationships among data items, algorithms and invocations of functions. The essence is abstract in that the conceptual construct is the same under many different representations. And he goes on to say that the hard part of building software is in knowing what to build rather than the building itself. This is a really important insight because it reflects the reality that the construction of a function or some abstraction that takes an input, does some transformation, and then sends it on its way, is a fairly known quantity at this point. So, as a result, the real difficulty is not in the construction, but rather in knowing what the input should be, what the output should be, where it should live in the ecosystem of subprograms that make up the programming system, and so on. There are several aspects of this unsolvable challenge which are explored specifically, and the first is complexity. Software is extremely complex and tends to grow geometrically in complexity as new elements are added, which is a result of the proliferation of possible interactions between the components. Complexity is crucial to software, however, as a single individual program can only be so useful in a vacuum of the others in the system. The second aspect of our unsolvable challenge is conformity. By this we talk about how every incremental addition of a program is extending something that already exists and as a result has to conform with the interfaces established beforehand. There are a lot of benefits to this, such as the fact that one does not need to reinvent the wheel every single time he wants to build something, but in exchange for that, he seeds some design autonomy in the process. The third aspect is changeability. What we mean by this is that even once software is built, that's not the end of the story for it. Programs have to be updated and maintained as business needs evolve over the course of time. Beyond business requirement changes, machine changes, new technologies are introduced that need to be adapted for, users change, laws change, 
And as a result of living in this world where everything around it is changing, the software is forced to change too. Perhaps the only certainty in this project is knowing that things will change. The fourth aspect is invisibility. Unlike physical products, which can be represented in images, diagrams, schemas, and other abstractions, software cannot be fully deconstructed in a way that captures its essence. A software diagram can capture one dimension of its existence, such as one use case at a time, or the relationship between different entities in a database, and so on, but they cannot fully encapsulate all aspects of the program, or all dimensions, if you will. With that being said, some things have happened over the course of time that has caused the industry to develop and become more productive almost by accident. The first one that the author mentions is the increasing use of high-level languages. High-level languages rescue the coder from a lot of the accidental complexity that he would otherwise encounter and have to solve for if using a low-level language. But with that being said, the productivity gain can only increase so much as a result of the increased abstraction that high-level languages afford, and thus it isn't quite the full-fledged silver bullet we've been looking for. Unified programming environments are another development that has caused an increase in productivity. For example, Dr. Docker can be used to ensure that all teammates are working with the same package versions and thus that they are developing in an environment that matches each other and the production environment as well. Thus, unpredictability that arises from running software in diverging environments is, to a large extent, mitigated. Looking toward the future, and recall that this chapter is decades old at the time of me recording this video, there was another big hope that object-oriented programming would be such a silver bullet, and the author shares that optimism to some extent. However, he opines that it can only be successful if type specification is the driving decider for how a programming product should be designed which I believe is starting to become the case in even some high program, higher level programming languages. Uh, you, can, you can declare types, for example. Artificial intelligence is another sensible silver bullet to explore. The implication is that software might evolve to the point that it has a sense of self, like in Westworld, and eventually will be able to self-create, and thus that development will become hyper-efficient or even obsolete to be done by humans. The blocker here is that while it is certainly possible to teach a computer to do one single thing, like play chess or do image recognition, we haven't even come within a light year of software that is able to do everything. And this is essentially what it would have to do to be able to automate the engineering process at a minimum, at a minimum. Now, with that being said, there is a concept called automatic programming, which is worth exploring, and I think this is a good one to watch. Given an environment with a very limited set of parameters, it's very possible for a computer to offer solutions to you on its own. And here are some examples. Ruby on Rails, the Ruby framework, out of the box generates the vast majority of a program's code when you start, when you initialize it for the first time. And after that, you're just left to customize the models, views, and controllers to make the behavior of the site which are particular to your needs. Another example is in autocomplete. IDEs these days are pretty smart, and I've noticed some personal productivity improvements as a result of it being able to predict things like the names of params that I'm entering and allowing it to autocomplete for me. Tools like linters also are huge for automatically ap applying stylistic improvements. And this is a massive leap forward for teams as it allows everyone to follow the same visual practices without necessarily needing individuals to change their 
their own, let's say, tabs versus spaces habits or other personal preferences in terms of how they write the code. It's just that by the time it gets saved and committed to the you know, master branch, it looks like everyone else's, and that's a huge win for the team overall. Incidentally, as I write scripts for these videos on Apple Notes, there's a non-trivial amount of autocomplete and autocorrect that's assisting me here too. So you see, you see these, these gains even in non-coding environments or in non-programming non use cases. All right, so there are a bunch more sections in this chapter, but I'm opting to leave them out since this video has already gotten pretty long and we're revisiting some of these topics in the next chapter. But the last point to make is that really good software is made by smart people who put in the effort to design it well more than anything else. And tools can assist, but ultimately the construction comes from our minds first. And that's something that transcends technology of the day both in the past, certainly in the present, and probably into the very distant future as well. That's all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it thought-provoking, and I'll see you all in the next one.